pretty flat. Uh, in other words, neither seems to be growing much at all. In fact, there was about 900 million ounces that came from mining back in 2016, and that's been the peak so far. So eight years ago, we saw a peak in silver, mi silver from mining. In other words, mined silver output. And we've seen, as I say, uh, recycling more or less flat. So this is quite telling when you think that, you know, we've been in a deficit scenario for four years and there's been no ability to, or, or perhaps there's been no desire. Really, yeah. it's difficult to say. My guess really is there's been no desire to try to produce more silver. That's at least part of the explanation. And so about five or six months ago, I started to do more research because I kept asking myself, and I had been asked by several people, why, how is it possible that, you know, if we're in multi years of multiple years of deficit, why is the silver price thing? It did run up. Let's be fair. In 2020, when we hit COVID, silver tanked, it went from 16 to $12, but then it exploded from 12 to $30. Uh -huh. And then from, say, August of 2020, it was in a range of say, $20, $22 to about $28 or so. And it's been moving sideways. So even if you take an average of maybe $24, $26, um, that's considerably higher than it was pre-COVID. Nonetheless, it looked like it was capped, like the, there was an inability for the price to move higher. And this was even in the face of these ongoing structural deficits. So I thought something's going on, you know, the, these the demand has been exploding and we can talk about that a little bit more uh, shortly but demand has been exploding and specifically in certain areas and um the uh real world asset wealth how to protect your wealth from the upcoming financial impact download this brand new report for free and get instant access to our resources click the button below the video now The supply had, has not been keeping up and the, the price seemed capped. So I started looking at mm -hmm. where could some of the supply be coming from? And what was very interesting was that I saw that you've got essentially three, four large futures exchanges around the world, which hold physical silver. And then you have ETFs. These are known um, inventories that we can track. And I, I call them um, secondary inventories. Be because uh, let's say prior to about 2020, 2021, for many years, there was a small surplus in silver each year, and that would just accumulate in, in these exchanges and in the ETFs. Well, that's completely reversed since 2021. We see all these ETFs, we see the, um, the futures exchanges, silver inventories have been dropping very steadily. If I had to give an overall number, I'd say on average, uh, they're down about 40% in the last four years. And so that was the conclusion I came to was that the large consumers of silver, mostly industrial consumers, and you don't recuperate that silver. Most of it is used in very small quantities. Once it's been consumed to make electronics or something in an, an automobile, for example, or a, a medical application uh, or any of these uh, uh, these different kinds of applications, the, the quantities are so small that once that product has lived out its life, it ends up in landfill. It's, it's not recuperable because the, the amount is so small, it doesn't pay to try to recycle it. So this, this is used up silver that we're likely never to see again. So the large consumers have had been, in my view, getting silver somewhere. Um, without having to demand it from new production, from mining or from even from recycling. In other words, I came to the conclusion they were draining the silver out of the ETFs and the mm -hmm. silver the futures exchanges. And that made sense to me because we saw these inventories draw down and um, not be replaced. We saw a steady drawing down of the inventories and we saw the price move sideways. So yeah. to me, that adds up. In other words, mm -hmm. You're not putting pressure to produce new supply because you have these 
above ground supplies just sitting there you, that you can draw down and you can pay for at prevailing prices. So that was the conclusion I came to. And it was funny because naturally I have, you know, contacts in this sector. Yeah. And um, someone sent to me a report uh, from TD Bank, uh, a large Canadian bank, which does research, commodities research, only maybe a few weeks after, you know, I had finished my research and they had the same conclusion and not only the same conclusion, but how long they thought that this could last. So when I was asked, I said, I think we have estimated estimated about 12 to maybe 24 months. This goes back three or four months uh, of being able to, you know, sort of cap the silver price uh, and, and, and not run out of silver from these inventories. And TD had the same conclusion, 12 to 24 months, and that this was where the silver supply was coming from. So, um, you know, uh, interestingly enough, we did see silver run shortly after that. I think that uh, when, in part at least, when the Silver Institute came out with their survey in April, they said we're having we're likely to have another um, deficit, structural de large deficit again this year, over 200 million ounces, which is again 20% of of overall supply that um, the market finally realized, okay, you know, this is not going away. <laughs> yeah. um, we we are going, if, unless su uh, mine supply and or recycling move up significantly, we are going to start to run out of silver. So that's when the, the price started to move. And we eventually went from, as I say, about 22 to, to $32. And now we're staying in a range of about 28 to 32 uh, for the last couple of months. And so- yeah. That's that's where I see things right now. Very good point, Pete. Uh, <laughs> as we know, silver has the industrial aspect and monetary aspect, and you said that. Which one will perform better in the future, in your opinion? So I think that um, I think that industrial will continue to. This is how I see it in in a simple uh, summary. I think industrial demand, which is quite steady and predictable, continues to provide like a rising floor under the silver price. Silver price will continue to move up. If if there were steady demand on both industrial and, and investment, we would see this price, the silver price continue to rise gradually. What happens though, is that um, the monetary side of silver, so the safe haven status uh, that silver uh, provides, similar to gold, is a bit of a wild card. It's not predictable. When people become concerned about uh, uh, financial right. stress, right? Geopolitics. They turned to gold first, which is has been you know uh, f a long time through history. Uh, but then, when gold gets has moved initially and has had a quite a run, uh, even just initially, and then you know people start to look at it, pay attention, wake up, and, and look at gold, and they see that it's had quite a run, and. Who knows, maybe at that point it's $2,700, maybe it's $3,000 for an ounce of gold. And they'll say, oh, that's that's a lot of money for one ounce. Uh, what else is there out 